Got milk? Not anymore. Everything is going just as I planned. Soon the entire world will be without dairy milk. No butter on toast, no ice cream, no cheddar cheese, and nothing but dry cereal. Nothing can stop me now. <laughs> As one of this franchise's many signature catchphrases goes, he's in there like swimwear. Spy Fox, Humongous Entertainment's fourth and final junior adventure titan, is finally here to have his time in the sun, and let me tell you what, the time is well deserved because the trilogy of adventure games that are being the topic of today's discussion are all games that I've eagerly been looking forward to ever since we wrapped up the Pajama Sam series in the previous video. Feel free to check that out by the way, along with all of the other overarching retrospectives I've made as well as the all-encompassing history video that details the gradual incline and eventual downfall of the company as a whole. It's a good watch, one of my proudest videos yet. Today's character in question just so happens to be a furry James Bond-like parody in the form of Spy Fox, a moderately laid-back wisecracking secret agent who has no issue spouting off witty comments at every possible opportunity he can get. The character was originally thought up by two of Humongous's original team members, Brad Carlton and Brett Barrett. According to a post made by Brad on the official Humongous alumni Facebook page, the story goes that he and Brett were working out at a gym one day when they originally came up with the idea. The character spawned out of their shared love towards spy movies and figured the character would make the perfect addition to the already growing cast of humongous characters at the time. And thus, Spy Fox was born. Unlike all other Humongous Entertainment Junior Adventure properties, this series tended to be a much older focus when it came to the design of the games, placing a much heavier emphasis on telling a gradual story featuring an arch-villain bent on world domination through some sort of ridiculous means, whether it be a giant robot dog or an aerosol can orbiting around the planet like a golden eye satellite. Puzzle solving in these games is still very much present, but they're a little more indirect when compared to something like Putt-Putt or Freddy fish. I feel like a lot of what's going on isn't as appealing to a younger kid as the other adventure series would be, which makes this one stand out as being one of the most different junior adventure series period. It really does feel like it's in a world of its own, separate from the others. I don't necessarily want to call it a black sheep of the company because it's a very, very solid franchise. At least, I seem to think so. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong on this, but it seems to me like Spy Fox is the least talked about and least recognized junior adventure franchise there is. I seem to notice far more people talking about Putt-Putt, Freddy Fish, and especially Pajama Sam, but Spy Fox doesn't always get that same love and it baffles me as to why. It certainly still has its fans, but just by comparison, it doesn't really seem even. But enough about that, it's time to quit stalling and get right into the first game of the series. Strap yourselves in because it's going to be one roller coaster of a video with how much I have to say about this series. I now present you with The Junior Adventures of Spy Fox, a humongous entertainment retrospective. somewhere over the Mediterranean Sea. Would you like our Italian entree, sir? No, thanks. It gives me hives. Our vegetarian dinner, then? Nope. Gives me the vapors. Then may I recommend the Greek plate? It's delicious. All right, if you insist. Enjoy. Well, friends, here it is. This here is undoubtedly the game that I probably have the most stories to share about, ranging from the first time I played it, to the boat, to the final sequence. There's just so much nostalgia jam-packed in here for me, and I cannot wait to dive into it. After Pajama Sam No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside, this is undeniably the most anticipated game I've had to talk about for the entire retrospective series. So apologies in advance if I go on for a little longer than usual when it comes to this game. Alright, before we start, I want to 
admit something. I honestly prefer to eat my cereal dry. Am I crazy? Am I a fool? No, I'm just partially lactose intolerant and don't really like how mushy milk makes cereal get when it sits for too long. Doesn't really matter the brand or type of cereal either, I've just never liked how milk causes it to get, but that's just a personal preference. Why is this relevant? Well, that's because the first game I'm talking about today is titled dry cereal. The first entry in the Spy Fox series sees the nefarious William the Kid taking over the entire dairy world by kidnapping all of the world's dairy cows and holding them hostage in his secret volcano lair located somewhere off the coast of Greece. It's up to Spy Fox to save the day before it's too late, otherwise the entire globe will be forced to consume goat byproducts for the rest of their lives. And immediately, I want to address what sets Spy Fox apart from all the other humongous properties in general up until this point. Unlike Freddy Fish or Pajama Sam, which tend to put more of an emphasis on puzzle solving and exploration of the environments that are in each game, Spy Fox prioritizes narrative above all else. Yes, the game still maintains the same point-and-click style of gameplay that we should all be very familiar with by this point, but fundamentally the game plays very differently from all other games. There are more cutscenes, more story beats, lots of rising and falling action, and a more linear mindset embedded into the design of the game's progression. Yes, alas, one of the unfortunate drawbacks of the Spy Fox series is that because it is trying to tell a more progressing story, the gameplay has to accommodate for that. I don't necessarily consider this a bad thing, however, because of its goals and intent. I praised Pajama Sam for being the most open-ended junior adventure series, period, and it still is regardless. The reason why I sang its praises so much is because it went all out with its world design. The main draw of the Pajama Sam series is getting to explore the unique and creative environments that were designed for each game. The Land of Darkness had so many iconic set pieces and environments that kept you coming back with a different purpose each time. There was no clear linear path to winning that game, and even then, the same was mostly true for Freddy Fish and Putt Putt too. Heck, I'd say the only game that comes close to the Spy Fox style of progression is the case of the missing kelp seeds, seeing as you have to acquire those bottles in a set order. Even the original two Putt Putt games were a bit more open-ended with the order that you could complete objectives. Dry Cereal wants to tell a more detailed story, but unfortunately, in order to do this, it has to be more strict in what it will and will not a player to access at certain points in the game. So, with that said, the story of the game goes like this. We find our intrepid secret agent Fox currently aboard a flight somewhere over the Mediterranean Sea. It is here where he receives his debriefing from his spy corps team leader, Monkey Penny. An obvious play on Money Penny, who tasks him with his first mission. It's good to see you, Agent Fox. Ha! Ah. Monkey Penny, now this is a real TV dinner. Right. And in case it wasn't already readily apparent, Spy Fox is heavily influenced and inspired by Ian Fleming's James Bond character. I mean, what other spy character is more recognizable in popular culture anyways? The spies in disguise? Pfft. Give me a break. Monkey Penny tells him how the current CEO of Amalgamated Moo Juice Incorporated, Howard Hugh Heffer Utterly III, had been kidnapped by William the Kid recently with the only clue left at the crime scene being none other than feta cheese. A type of cheese primarily known for being made from a mixture of sheep or goat milk. And this is where I want to highlight another crucial detail about Spy Fox. The writing. Considering the fact that Spy Fox is aimed at a much older audience than the other humongous properties, say anywhere from 8 to 12, there was more of a focus placed on the writing and characters of the game, and with this came the introduction of puns, metaphors, double meanings, and so much more. Hello, you've reached the offices of Amalgamated Moo Juice Incorporated. Our staff is a little tied up right now, so we'll have to get back to you as soon as we're rescued. I'd better try another number. Just the concept of a villain alone is enough to emphasize how clever it is. William the Kid, a bigwig executive and head of his own milk company known as Nectar of the Goat, which is abundantly labeled all over the game using its abbreviation of NOG. The true genius of this villain and his company can be seen when you read between the lines. Nog can obviously be derived from eggnog, you know, that one drink that's popular during the holidays, typically a milk substitute of some kind. But this is also a play on words of the saying, nectar of the gods, a phrase typically used to describe the taste of a beverage that is splendid or delightful. 
faithful, the best of the best. The main villain is of goat, of course, a competing animal that is seen as lesser than to that of the cow when it comes to dairy products, and he's also a play on the infamous Billy the Kid, a prominent western outlaw known for killing 21 men back in the 1800s before dying at the ripe young age of 21. Billy the Kid gets referenced in plenty of popular culture, so I wouldn't necessarily call this reference obscure, but what makes this interpretation especially unique is that it's a play on words. The term kid is usually used to refer to a young goat, whereas Billy is typically a nickname for William, hence the naming of the character William the Kid. What's also really cool is that the island of Acidophilus is actually named after a special form of bacteria that's commonly found in, you guessed it, milk. So once again, the game proves it's consistent with its motif of dairy products. Another important detail to keep in mind is that around the time that this game was produced, the famous Got Milk ad campaign was enormous. I mean, literally everything in pop culture at the time was endorsing it. Celebrities, movies, TV shows, you name it. And that thing carried on for years after the fact. And so, Spy Fox decided to indirectly make an entire game about it. Getting back to the story of the game though, now that that tangent has subsided, immediately following his debriefing, Spy Fox finds himself ejected from the plane and falling to his death because he left his parachute in his other tuxedo. Thus, it is up to his set of spy pens to help him get out of this jam. I wish I hadn't left my parachute in my other tuxedo. Maybe one of my special spy gadgets will help me. I wonder which one I should pick. I don't think I can have my cake and eat it too. What good is this without helium? This isn't such a safe bet. Hmm. If you thought that was impressive, you should have seen the one that got away. And immediately from the get-go, we see the exact sense of humor that this game is going for. Spy Fox is a dry, nonchalant kind of guy who rarely panics in any situation and always finds a witty comment to make no matter the circumstances. I can see why some may not necessarily latch onto this kind of character, but I absolutely love this guy. Upon arrival on the island, he immediately rendezvous with Monkey Penny in the Spy Corps Mobile Command Center, disguised as a sunken ship acting as a phone booth in the middle of the town square. A stroke of genius, if I do say so myself. During this conversation, she hands him his first spy gadget of the game, a form of item specifically made for the Spy Fox series. And what's a spy without his gadgets, right? We'll come back to this later. And this is a, a toothbrush. And I sure could use one after that airplane meal. Don't put that in your mouth. My reaction, exactly. Shortly thereafter, he ends up discovering Mr. Utterly in an old nog factory roped up above a pit of piranha. What a tub of piranha have to do with an old factory down by the dock? I have no idea, but even the game points out how out of place it is. Piranha. I wonder what a South American fish that can eat creatures hey! alive has to do with making cheese. Of course, with enough thinking, the player is able to rescue him, thus concluding the tutorial sequence of the game. Just like how Putt-Putt and Pajama Sam's first titles introduced an indirect tutorial sequence through its game design and structure, Spy Fox follows suit. Click points are still very much present in this game, by the way, don't think I've forgotten. I just usually don't go out of my way to look for them in the Spy Fox series as much. Although one in particular that I really do enjoy is the sound effects that play for the pipe located outside of the Feta factory. It's just so oddly satisfying. <laughs> When interviewing Mr. Utterly, Spy Fox learns of how he was captured in a rather amusing sequence where Utterly tells his version of the story to make himself sound cool while we see what actually happened through the visuals on screen. There were dozens of them. I fought them hoof and nail. Pow, 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 I did. My whole body is a weapon. Then suddenly, I smelled something revolting. It could only be one thing. Feta cheese! cheese. This is one of those jokes that I never got until I was a bit older, but it's amusing to me now, nevertheless. He also proceeds to go over the full extent of William the Kid's plan and informs Spy Fox of his primary objective, disable the milky weapon of destruction that he plans to use to flood the world with dairy milk. 
It is also here where Quack arrives on the scene, this universe's version of Q from James Bond. He's the guy responsible for all of the gadgets available in the game, and he also goes over each one of them as Spy Fox inquires about them as well. The game features six different gadgets, two of which are required to use for every playthrough while the other four vary from scenario to scenario. My personal favorite out of all of these is the Spy Putty, if only because of Quack's mild rant about how he came up with the idea before Silly Putty did. Hmm, that looks rather silly. I know what you're thinking. You think that the Spy Putty looks a lot like that silly stuff they sell in toy stores. What you don't know is that I thought of it first. <laughs> Those duplicitous duplicators stole my idea! I think the best way to try and describe the breakdown of Dry Cereal would be to segment it into four chunks. The first sequence contains everything from the introduction up until the cutscene after rescuing Mr. Utterly, and the second sequence is the portion of the game that we are entering now. Now, the cool thing about Spy Fox and Dry Cereal is that despite it being a relatively linear game, it does support multiple playthroughs, with Dry Cereal having the most possible combinations out of any Spy Fox game. The first diversion in the paths of this game comes in the form of the method taken to get to William the Kid's secret fortress. These paths are what I unofficially call the Car Path and the Boat Path. Whether or not these terms are widely accepted is alien to me, but they're what I've always called them. I encountered the car path on my first ever playthrough as a kid, so that's the one I'm going to go over first. Plus, it's the far easier of the two for reasons I'll be getting into later. Now, regardless of which path gets rolled, the same objective applies at the start. Get on board the SS Deadweight. To do this, you simply acquire an invitation to get on board, which doesn't take too long, and then you arrive for a party hosted by the owner of the ship, Russian Blue. Little known fact about Russian Blue here, she's an addict for tangoing. As Spy Fox quickly learns when getting some information from Monkey Penny back at the Spy Corps Mobile Command Center. Russian Blue. She also goes by Ms. Blue, Old Blue, and Kitty Kitty Kitty. Occupation. Owner and operator of the SS Deadweight. Head of public relations for NOG. Close associate of William the Kid and one bad kitty. Known felonies? Indecent tangoing. Acquitted. Dancing with intent to tango? Acquitted. J-tangoing. Acquitted. Tangoing out of season? Acquitted. She also tells him that she's been reported as being in cahoots with William the Kid, and is a primary suspect for determining the location of Kid's secret fortress. Spy Fox's Spy Watch also comes with an additional minigame, Happy Fun Sub. It's a simple game, but a fun one nonetheless, that consists of the player swapping between a plane, boat, and submarine vehicle as they avoid obstacles and get collectibles with the goal of getting to the end of each stage. Every Spy Fox game includes a minigame like this, however, I personally never invest that much time into playing them, but still, I wanted to acknowledge its existence at the very least because it is a fun optional side distraction that's present in the game. I suppose now is a good time to discuss another feature introduced specifically for the Spy Fox series, Talk Balloons. Inside Spy Fox's jacket pocket, he holds many things, the gadget pouch, miscellaneous items, and a notepad, which is useful for whenever Spy Fox encounters a character that he needs to gather more information on before being able to progress. This is a cool feature that kind of plays into the whole detective work aspect of being a spy, and by going around the game and asking different characters about the person in question, the game responds with different lines of dialogue to help point the player in the right direction. My personal favorite character to question about the various individuals roaming around the island is Bee Bear. B is a stapled character of the series, similar to how Carrot makes recurring appearances in every Pajama Sam game. She's always got something interesting to share and is an excellent source of information. Always. These speech bubbles are another integrated feature of the game that indicates it's aimed at an older audience. Younger kids aren't going to be as interested or paying attention to what these characters are necessarily communicating, whereas an older child who's more fascinated by the story probably would be. Of course, this varies from child to child, but generally speaking, I think it holds true that more younger kids would rather play Freddy Fish than Spy Fox, and vice versa for the older crowd. And if you want to get a good feel of what the island's residents are like in Acidophilus, look no further than this muscular pelican right here. Hey, wanna see my tattoo? Wanna, wanna see, see my, my tattoo? 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 After speaking to Monkey Penny about Russian Blue, she brings in one of their tracking bugs, 
a literal tracking bug named Walter Wireless for Fox to slip onto her when she's not looking, which he eventually succeeds at. But first, in order to get on the ship, Spy Fox needs to acquire an invitation because this conniving weasel standing guard at the front entrance refuses to let him in no matter what method of persuasion he attempts to pull on him. Did I mention that deck chairs are sort of a hobby of mine? Perhaps I could just run up there and see what types are being used. I'm sorry, sir, but the deck chairs have been cleared away to create an entertaining dance floor. Interesting approach, though. I'm here to sign up for the shuffleboard class that starts in uh, about five minutes. So, you better let me shuffle up the gangplank. Sir, this is a private party for only the most exclusive, important people on the island. And they don't play shuffleboard. Look, a meteorite is about to crash into the village. Sir is obviously getting a little desperate. Might I suggest you go home and take a little nap? Come on, just let me on board for five minutes. You can even time me if you want. Sir, do you even understand what the basic concept behind an invitation is? It means someone has to invite you first. Oh, by the way, XYZ, uh, PDQ. Nice try. However, if you were a little more observant, you would no doubt notice that I'm not wearing any pants. A kind of lesser observed detail that I really like about this weasel character is that he's such a stuck-up prude that even the other residents talk badly about him behind his back. Even the pianist at the cantina seems to have some kind of beef with him. I don't imagine that weasel of a doorman shows his face around here. <laughs> oh, no way man, nada, uh-uh, sorry, bye-bye. That guy will treat you like a king if you have an invitation. Otherwise, you may as well be a piece of dry toast. Dry toast? Okay, then. And when Johnny Gecko is dissing him, you know something's up. Of course, once you present the invitation to him, his entire demeanor changes, and the way Spy Fox reacts to this sudden turnaround couldn't be any more satisfying. I trust you will have an enjoyable visit. And if there is any way in which I can kiss up some more, sir, I trust you will let me know. But of course. And just as with the ah yes from Putt Putt Travels Through Time, I find myself quoting the but of course time and time again still to this very day. Finally, after some brief investigation and asking around, Spy Fox has managed to climb aboard the SS Deadweight and is ready to slip Walter Wireless into Russian Blue's purse. In order to distract her, Spy Fox needs to force her to, you guessed it, tango, but with the current ship conductor playing the waltz, the player needs to find a way around this problem. Although, that tune he's playing might sound awfully familiar to some more experienced Humongous fans. How cool is that? You want to talk about subtle references? It doesn't get more subtle than that. Hmm, I guess you can teach old dogs new tricks. After placing Walter in her purse, Russian leaves in a hurry and races over to Kid's fortress, but not before discovering Walter at the entrance. Thus, Fox follows the coordinates provided by Walter in an admittedly exciting driving sequence where the player is asked to follow the same path that Walter tracked while on board in Russian Blue's purse. Select the correct direction and you get a funny little animation. Choose the wrong passage, however, and this happens. <laughs> Eventually though, after choosing the correct pathway, Spy Fox arrives at a door guarded by a password of some sort made up by different hieroglyphic-like images that can only be solved by meeting with a fellow Spy Corps contact, Mata Harry. The stars are in alignment. And so are the tires on my car. Of course, in doing so, Spy Fox gains access to the cave, which then leads to a giant pit of snapping turtles with a door on the other side. Thankfully, with the help of Quack's suction cups, Spy Fox is able to sidle on over to the other side, thus granting him access to Kid's fortress. And now for the other potential pathway. 
the infamous boat path. <laughs> All right, I'm sure any Spy Fox fan watching this video knows exactly what I'm getting at here. So upon arrival at the SS Deadweight on this potential pathway, not only will the weasel be present demanding an invitation, but a local shipman by the name of Captain Drydock will be present as well. Captain here is Spy Fox's ticket to discovering the lair of William the Kid on this particular playthrough because while Russian Blue is still present on the ship, she never leaves in any hurry and thus there's no way to travel. Her. After doing some sleuthing around, Spy Fox actually determines that because Russian Blue is the owner of the SS Deadweight, he should be able to track her recent voyages and discover the coordinates of Kid's lair via this method instead. The problem is, this guy won't let him. Hey, that's confidential. You're not supposed to be looking at that. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. I would never dream of doing anything like spying. <laughs> And so, in order to get past him, he needs to disguise himself as a fellow sailor coming to take over his shift, and manually adjust the clock so he hears his cue to leave. After all, just showing up isn't enough. This guy is so dedicated to his hard work slaving over this singular orange button all day long that he knows when his shift is over. I'm glad that this game made the puzzle more difficult though, rather than just putting on the hat and calling it a day, and that's the case for most of this game's puzzles in general. Sometimes the solution to them is to complete multiple objectives at once in order to achieve a result. It's the same as with getting into kids' base on the car path. The player needs to A, follow the correct driving path, B, meet with Mata Harry to acquire the code, which the game doesn't tell you about by the way, that's a puzzle all on its own, and C, figure out how to scale across the giant pit of snapping turtles and and then doing so. Now, instead of having multiple steps along one path chained together, as introduced by Pajama Sam, there are multiple chains chained together to create one larger path. Of course, the boat path also has multiple chains strapped together, and this brings us back to Captain James Tiberius Drydock. That sure is an old boat you've got there. I, the SS Enterprise, and I have gone through it all together. Hurricanes, whirlpools, giant squid, and even a nasty tax audit. But through it all, she's always been like a mother to me, but without the guilt. The raccoon's a parody of Captain Kirk, by the way, in case it wasn't obvious enough by his name, dialect, and shirt color. Turns out Drydock lost his lucky charm in a heated game of Go Fish against Otimus J. Big Pig down at the cantina. Not sure what the dude was drinking that made him bet his lucky charm, but without it, he's not willing to go out on open water because to him, it just spells bad news. Thus, it's up to Spy Fox to win the lucky charm back in a game of Go Fish. Greetings. Interested in a little game of Go Fish, Mr. Fox? Spy Fox. I've been known to play Go Fish from time to time, and you are? Artemis J. Big Pig. Pleased to make your acquaintance, sir. Ooh, I hate this guy. I hate this guy. I hate him so much. Look at that smug grin on his face. That's the face of someone that's just asking for it. I cannot stand him. Mr. Big Pig here is single-handedly the most difficult challenge present in any humongous entertainment junior adventure game, bar None. This guy is so ridiculously brutal when it comes to Go Fish that I don't think I've ever had a single playthrough where I beat him on my first try. Okay, that's probably not true, I've played this game a lot, so it's pretty likely I have beaten him on my first go before, but I hardly remember if I did, because all I have is this memory of him wiping the floor with me and making me cry as a kid because I could never beat him. I mean, look at this guy. He just sits there and laughs as he slaughters all of these poor innocent children who just want to play a fun adventure game. The sick monster. And some may think I'm overreacting, but no. Those who've stared directly into the eyes of this foul, foul creature know exactly what I'm talking about. You want a Go Fish simulator that crushes your hopes and dreams? Look no further than Mr. Big Pig. I was stuck here on my playthrough for this video trying to beat this guy for over 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Literally half an hour of my life thrown away trying to beat this stupid pig at a card game. I could have beaten the entirety of Putt Putt Joins the Parade in that time. I don't know what, I don't know how, all I know is that I'm incredibly suspicious of whether or not the computer is cheating because he just seems to have this uncanny any ability to know exactly what card I draw from the pile whenever this game gets down to the wire. Every single time, even when he has loads of cards in his hands, yet he seems to know mine. Every time. I mean, look at this. Got any twos? 
Got any sixes? Got any fours? Got any eights? Hmm, got any tens? Got any fives? Got any threes? Got any jacks? Ah, how delightful. That gives me a suit, sir. Got any eights? Got any fours? Got any kings? Hmm, got any tens? Got any sixes? That is absurd, and there's no difficulty option either. It doesn't matter whether you're eight or 25, he is the same brutal difficulty every playthrough. But with that rant over, eventually, after enough war of attrition, the player will probably end up getting lucky enough to beat Mr. Big Pig at his own game, acquire the lucky charm for Captain Drydock, and head off to the coordinates listed on the SS Deadweight's navigation screen. Just don't forget to grab the frog suit while on board the ship, as that's vital to the next half of the pathway. Whew, and that brings us to the underwater section. You know, as much as I loathe Mr. Big Pig, the underwater section is one of my favorite moments in the entire game and almost makes the hair pulling frustration feel worth it. Upon arrival to the coordinates listed on the SS Deadweight sea chart, Spy Fox takes notice of a weird white liquid coming up from the sea floor, a substance that he instantly recognizes as dairy milk. Turns out Kid is dumping all the world's milk into the ocean, or at least whatever leftover liquid remains after powering his milky weapon of destruction. Donning his trusty frog suit, Spy Fox proceeds to hop on in and get to the bottom of things where he comes across two Nog guards that are on patrol. And every time I come into this area, I'm immediately drawn back to my first time playing this game. First grade, to be exact. I specifically remember getting to this screen for the first time in my life. All day at school, all I could think about was witnessing this brand new underwater section and how I was supposed to get past the guards. I'll admit, I had no idea what I was supposed to do the first time around, but it fascinated me after being stuck on Big Pig for what felt like weeks on end with no luck. And something that's always baffled me, even to this day, is the way the cutscene plays out for the second guard that Spy Fox ends up hooking. I hate to be the bearer of an underwater wedgie, but I've run out of options. Excuse me. Whoa! Gabs! Like... Where is that, excuse me, coming from? Is it the guard saying that? Is it Spy Fox? The voice clip doesn't match either of the characters, judging by the scream that the guard lets out immediately afterwards, so I'm just left wondering what it is exactly. I've never understood it in all my years of living. And have I praised this game's soundtrack yet? I don't think I have. Seriously, I think Spy Fox 1 might very well have the best soundtrack of any humongous game, period. Did I say the same for Freddy Fish 1 or Pajama Sam 1? Well, I take it back if I did. This is the best humongous soundtrack. No doubts about it. I love the perfect blend of piano and synthesizer. Every background track matches the vibe and setting perfectly. I could not ask for better songs. The atmosphere of the underwater areas is superb, and I absolutely love leaning back to the calm, relaxing tunes of Acidophilus on the land. Yes, these worms are definitely frogophobic. And as if those weren't enough, William the Kid's evil lair gets even better. But I digress. After eliminating the guards and breaking through the solid steel door with the rocket that's attached to a crashed submarine, Spy Fox manages to gain entry to Kid's lair where he's stopped by a door with a panel on it that's missing a passcode device of some sort. This is, of course, where Mata Harry comes into play to give Spy Fox the code breaker that will let him in the door. But in order to do so, he needs to provide the specific day, month, and day of the week in order to gain entry. Better hope the player was paying attention to the special listed on the wall in the cantina that day, as well as the date on the ship, otherwise the player will need to go all the way back and find them. I won't lie, this specific puzzle doesn't really feel like a puzzle so much as it is just a reason to pad out the game a little longer by making the player backtrack when it doesn't actually benefit the story or gameplay in any way, but this is just about the only complaint I really have to give. 
However, seeing as it's just a one-time thing, I can easily overlook it. But upon entering that door, both pathways merge back into each other as the player is brought into the main hub of Kid's Lair, bringing us into the third section of the game. This section features another variation of potential branching in the form of the item needed to deactivate the Milky Weapon of Destruction which is presented when Russian Blue and Kid meet inside the base. This item in particular can either be the key, the punch card, or the diode which all vary from playthrough to playthrough. This isn't as quite a big of a divergence as the car and boat paths, but they are one longer puzzle that requires different steps to solve. Personally speaking, I think the key is the weakest of the three, seeing as you just need to rearrange this laser grid in Kid's office in order to obtain it, whereas the punch card requires you to go to Kid's office and scribble over the sheet of paper in order to figure out which safe has the correct punch card hidden inside it, and then using these cheese and crackers gadget to crack the combination. The cool thing about this room is that it's actually the same room that's locked when trying to enter it earlier on in the game, so in a way this creates a giant loop that easily allows the player back to Acidophilus without forcing them to go all the way around in a giant circle again. It's cool, I love design like this. I will say, one thing I greatly enjoy is the scene that plays when the player figures out how to get past the guards that are blocking the entry to Kid's office. <laughs> It's so overdramatic with the heartbeat and constant close-ups, but I still love it all the same. Last but not least is the diode, which creates two rooms only accessible when this item in particular is the one selected, otherwise they are just empty walls at the top of Kid's Fortress. One of these rooms leads into the hamster room, which is generating the power for that section of the facility. The other door leads to this excessively long hallway that for some reason I thought took way longer to navigate as a kid. Maybe that was just my attention span, who knows? but it felt like it took forever to get to the end of the room, whereas in reality it's only like 20 seconds. Anyway, when the player figures out how to trick the rabbit into leaving by turning the power off, they can sneak in and snatch the diode while looking absolutely ridiculous with a shoe on their face. I really enjoy all three of these puzzles. Like I said, the key, despite being the item I rolled on my first ever playthrough, is undoubtedly the weakest of the three, but the other two I greatly enjoy for being multi-step puzzles that really encourage the player to explore the evil fortress. With a phenomenal soundtrack to boot, might I add, but you've already heard about that. Thus, with the deactivation item in hand, Spy Fox heads to the control room and deactivates the Milky Weapon of Destruction, much to the chagrin of William the Kid. But luckily, though, he's got a backup plan and immediately begins flooding the dairy cow's holding pen with their own milk, essentially attempting to drown them all so that the species goes extinct. Lucky for Spy Fox, though, Kid ends up getting his ascot stuck in the doorway to the control room, which gives away the location. And after arriving up to the Goat Milk Parody billboard, Spy Fox enters the room to find one of two possible roadblocks, a pit of alligators or a cockadoodle foo fighter. Hello there, puny puppy-like creature. You are probably intimidated by my rippling muscles. This here introduces another random puzzle element of the game that can vary from playthrough to playthrough completely independently of all other puzzles before, meaning that there are inherently 12 different combinations of puzzles present in the game for the player to experience. Sure, the game may be linear progression-wise, but the puzzle diversity is certainly still there for this title. Both of these puzzles, though, sad to say, basically have the same solution in which Spy Fox needs to go see B at the cantina. Depending on the items in the room, this actually acts as a form of foreshadowing as to what the final challenge will end up being when the player finally reaches that point in the story. These two condiment bottles and the chicken knuckles sign indicate alligators, which are also hinted at with the empty carton scattered around the actual alligator room, nice attention to detail there, while the trophy indicates cockadoodle foo. Personally, I prefer the alligator puzzle because you can actually prepare for that one ahead of time by getting the chicken knuckles early, whereas you have to go talk to B after talking with the cockadoodle foo fighter in order to get her book of counterattack from her but I can't deny that the second option is more fun. The sheer absurdity of the different moves that he will use, as well as the names of the counterattacks that Spy Fox uses as well, is nothing short of amusing. Plus, there's even a reference to one of their other humongous characters thrown in there too. All right, my little furball, now try the pajama slam on for size. 
But I gotta say though, does William the Kid have a thing for animals that bite or what? Piranha, snapping turtles, and now alligators? What's next? Sharks? Rattlesnakes? Come on. Upon getting past this room, Spy Fox reaches the control room and frees the cows, successfully defeating William the Kid and putting a stop to his control over the dairy world. But William still has one more trick up his sleeve, and this introduces my absolute favorite feature exclusive to the Spy Fox series. Optional reaction-based endings. So Spy Fox and Dry Cereal actually has three different endings if you can believe it or not. Okay, technically two, but the bad ending could be obtained in one of two different ways. This is a tradition in every Spy Fox game that originated during Dry Cereal, but when William the Kid attempts to escape in his villainous blimp after Spy Fox frees the cows, the player has a brief window of opportunity to click on the stationary Nog truck that's setting next to the garage door. Should the player fail to click on this truck within the time frame, Kid gets away and Spy Fox is immediately taken to the bad ending of the game. Click on the truck in time though, and the player gains access to a surprise chase sequence in order to attempt to catch William the Kid as he's escaping. Next, this brings in another reaction event in the form of the ramp positioned at the end of the road. Miss and the player get sent back to the bad ending as if they never even left Kid's fortress. React fast enough and Spy Fox ends up rocketing through the air, ejecting from the truck, and landing on Kid's blimp safe and sound. This concept of the final area is similar to that seen in Freddy Fish, although the prominent difference between the two is the fact that Freddy's end screens are mandatory because they are used as the penultimate puzzle that leads to the inevitable solution to the case in that particular game. Spy Fox's bonus final area is just that, a bonus. Totally optional, potentially missable, final epilogue to the game should the player go out of their way to access it. And let me tell you, as a young kid playing this for the first time, it's likely that this ending sequence will be missed on a first playthrough. Heck, I probably didn't discover the secret ending until my fourth or fifth time if I'm being honest with you. But man was it a surprise to me when I discovered a brand new section of the game I had never seen before after thinking I had witnessed everything I thought the game had to offer. The secret final area of the game. This is where Spy Fox can take down the evil villain once and for all, and in the case of Dry Cereal, it requires the player to sneak into the main blimp control room and reset the coordinates to Spy Jail while also ejecting Kid from his chair without him realizing until it's too late. It's a pretty simple puzzle that only takes place across two screens, so it's not the most complicated thing in the world. In fact, if I had to ask for anything, it would have been for the blimp to just be one or two screens bigger to add a bit more length to the puzzle overall. Confining the final section to such a small area leads to more limitations on the complexity of the puzzle. Even still, to me this is the perfect way to end an already phenomenal game and I couldn't have asked for a better climax. I still remember the first time I got to this blimp, again it was early in the morning before school, second grade I think, all I could think about all day long was what would happen now that I was on the blimp. Tell you what, always cherish those memories of the first time you play a video game because you can only experience a game for the first time once. Don't let that opportunity go to waste. But after setting the correct coordinates and preparing Kid's ejector seat, Spy Fox says one final goodbye before sending Kid off to prison for good. Thus concluding Spy Fox in Dry Cereal. Should the player successfully invade Kid's ship and send him off to Spy Jail, the player will then receive the good ending, which ultimately isn't all that different from the bad ending. And honestly, I shouldn't even use the term bad ending. Regardless of whether or not Kid is caught, Spy Fox still disables the weapon and frees the cows, so I guess it would be better to say good or best ending now that I think about it. The only major difference between the two endings is that Walter Wireless opens the best ending as a news broadcaster, whereas the good ending cuts straight to Spy Fox with the president, and the size of the cookie that Bull Clinton here gives Spy Fox in the final award ceremony. Otherwise, they're relatively the same. Still, a better incentive to go for the best ending, but the good ending is still fine enough of a conclusion. But that concludes Spy Fox and Dry Cereal. Is it obvious I absolutely love this game? I mean, considering I just spent like 30 minutes on the thing by itself and there's still plenty more games to get to after it, I think that's enough of an indication. I've basically exhausted myself at this point just talking about this singular title, but it was worth it. An absolute blast from start to finish. 
finished. I could never go wrong with the first Spy Fox game. It's my favorite title in the franchise by a landslide and one of my absolute favorite humongous games. It is single-handedly one of the best designed, well-written, replayable adventure games humongous has ever made. But I better stop now before I just end up repeating myself again. Solid title from beginning to end. I cannot sing its praises enough. For outstanding heroism and suaveness in the face of utter dairy chaos, and for bringing the nefarious William the Kid to justice, I award you, Spy Fox, our nation's highest honor. May I present you with the Big Daddy Congressional Cookie of Justice. Why, thank you, Mr. President. It was a routine mission, really. Three cheers for Spy Fox. I've got my cookie. Has anyone got milk? It's mine, all mine. The most delicious and expensive slice of heaven on earth is mine now. The famous Limburger cheese. Stop where you are. You're under spy arrest. Threat! It's that blasted spy fox again. You'll never catch me! <laughs> Look out, Spy Fox! Russian Blue's thugs are on your tail! As to be expected by this point in the humongous entertainment timeline, like the other junior adventure franchises that came before it, Spy Fox got his fair share of spin-off arcade titles within the relatively few years that he was even around. Yep, the truth of the matter is that Spy Fox was the shortest lived junior adventure franchise of them all, existing from only 1997 to 2001, and yet within that period of time there still managed to be two different junior arcade titles released, the first of which being Spy Fox in Cheese Chase. While it's never been outright stated to my knowledge, I believe this game takes place sometime after the events of Dry Cereal given the context of the main villain, Russian Blue, who is seen escaping after stealing a rather valuable wheel of Limburger cheese from the nearby museum with the assistance of Nog Grunts providing her support along the way. My guess is that with Billy the Kid behind bars, the remaining Nog henchmen still needed a job, and so they turned to Russian Blue for guidance, which of course led to the events of this game. That is, of course, my own personal theory. Whether or not it's actually true, well, that's an unsolved mystery as far as I'm concerned. I actually ended up getting Cheese Chase as part of the 2002 Atari re-release package alongside Dry Cereal. Yes, yes, I know I diss Atari time and time again when it comes to how poorly they treated Humongous Entertainment, but I'm not going to deny the truth of me owning one of their versions of the game. And it's also the only Atari re-release of any of the Humongous games that I own. And it's not like I knew either at the time, given that I was just a young kid and my father, who was the one buying these games for me, probably had no idea what was actually going on with the company at this point. But anyways, yeah, this is another one of those junior arcade titles that I had forgotten I've played before, and actually this one is probably the one I've played the most out of any junior arcade game prior to this video series. Not that that's saying much because it probably comes to a total of like 45 minutes. Spy Corps catches wind of this crime and Spy Fox himself hops on his spy scooter to give chase after Russian Blue down the streets of wherever they happen to be, probably somewhere in Europe if the last game was anything to go off of, establishing the premise of this game's arcade-styled concept. The entire game is one gargantuan chase sequence spanning 100 levels with slightly different changes made with every benchmark that is reached. For the most part, however, as with all of the other arcade games, eventually the gimmicks wear out their welcome and the game becomes more of a grind to get through rather than a fun experience that is always presenting new challenges to encounter. By this point, I'm getting a little tired 
tired of playing these spin-offs because other than the exclusive cutscenes that I've hardly ever seen before, I'm personally not getting anything out of them. But hey, there's probably an audience for these games out there somewhere, so I do want to give them a few minutes of discussion because it's only fair. So as for Cheese Chase, the game is played simply by dragging the mouse pointer along the screen in order to guide Spy Fox around different obstacles and pick up power-ups to defeat any Nog enemies that may come his way. It's a relatively simple concept that starts off easy with just a few hazards here and there, but it gets progressively more difficult as the game goes on. Essentially, the goal of each level is to get to the end without crashing into anything as that instantly brings the level to an end and the player would have to start all over again. However, there are also other factors going on simultaneously that the player needs to consider, such as their gas tank, hazards, and enemies. Scattered along the path every so often lies gas cans containing a certain amount of fuel, red cans which contain a small sample, green tanks containing a medium amount, and blue cans which basically net a full tank of gas in an instant. What's really cool about this game and a small detail I admire is that the engine of whatever Spy Fox is riding actually reflects how much fuel is left in the tank as an audio cue. So the player isn't constantly forced to shift their eyes to the right of the screen to look at their tank while trying to avoid obstacles because they can use the sound to make a judgment call of where their tank is currently at. I commend Cheese Chase for implementing this feature. In the levels where things can get really chaotic, this is actually a godsend, so I wanted to call attention to it for that purpose. There are also road hazards in the form of things like sewage drains, clouds, narrow passageways, and so on that will force the player to navigate around them in a specific manner in order to stay on screen. Should Spy Fox fall too far back, this meter on the left hand side will start to deplete. If it reaches the full amount, then the level instantly ends because Spy Fox fell too far behind. And then of course there are the Nog enemies. These guys aren't as dangerous as they may seem because they don't cause an instant crash if they bump into the player, rather they instead try to bump Spy Fox into other obstacles in order to get him to crash, and the only way to get rid of them is to either bump them back into obstacles themselves or use the various banana pie or plunger power ups that can be picked up throughout each stage. It's very much like an arcade shooter in that sense, that's for sure. As the footage I've been showing would indicate, there are four different vehicle types and aesthetics in the game in the form of the scooter, jet ski, snowmobile, and helicopter that don't serve any functional differences but are instead just how the game switches things up akin to the way the levels would change in something like Putt Putt and Pep's Dog on a Stick. Still, it's a cool feature that kind of mixes things up a bit and there's a unique cutscene that plays for each vehicle transition that occurs every 10 levels. Of course, given that there's only four vehicle types though, these cutscenes get repeated for levels 41 to 80 and then again for 81 to 100 in intervals of 5 levels rather than 10, but hey, beggars can't be choosers, right? It's cool that there are 4 different schemes at all because the game could have just been 100 levels of scooter driving and that would get boring incredibly quickly. Something weird though, and I'm not sure if there's an explanation for this, is that the cutscenes are all in this weird ultra wide aspect ratio that are letterboxed to such an excessive amount. Was this an artistic choice? Was it to make the cutscenes simpler to animate due to the time or budget constraints? It has me wondering because while it doesn't completely take me out of the game, it is a very strange choice given that all of the arcade titles up until this point had full screen, wholly animated intro and outro cutscenes. But hey, it's not a deal breaker. After beating the arguably non-kid friendly final level, the final cutscene of the game shows Spy Fox trapping and catching Russian Blue at a drive through while she tries to place an order, allowing her to get caught and arrested so that Spy Corps can once again save the day. And that's Spy Fox and Cheese Chase. I guess as two more brief side notes, as with most other junior arcade games, there is the option to create custom user levels, but I didn't find any interest in that. And the Junior Helper feature returns from the two Freddy Fish arcade titles for players who may find themselves struggling as they progress through the game. Like I said, some of the later levels can be extremely unfriendly for kids to play, so I don't blame them for incorporating this feature to accommodate for that difficulty spike. All in all though, it's a fine title. I had fun playing it, but I am not itching to go back to it again. It's cool seeing a semi-epilogue to Dry Serial, considering that the upcoming sequel game doesn't really build off of the first at all, but that only goes so far. Still though, it's a fun time, and I'd put it towards the top half of the arcade spin-off games after having played so many of them. I'm in a hurry. All I need is one large frosty beverage. Oh, 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 oh.
I said one large frosty beverage, please. Is it too much to ask for one large frosty beverage? Thank you. That wasn't so hard, was it? So much for your frosty beverage, Russian Blue. The gig's up. Thanks, Quack. It was my pleasure, Mr. Vinebox. <laughs> Somewhere in the Alps. So, Agent Gracefully, you're part of our spy exchange program from Canada? Try not to say my name too often. I'm trying to travel incognito. Actually, you're traveling in the Alps. What do you have there? I got something very important out of a smelly trash can. Well, of course it's smelly if you got it out of a trash can. You need a hobby. So, following that last game comes the sequel to one of Humongous Entertainment's greatest adventure titles ever made, Spy Fox 2 Some Assembly Required, a worthy successor to the first title, but not a game I personally remember as fondly. After the first Pajama Sam and Freddy Fish games, Dry Cereal is undeniably the adventure game I've spent the most amount of time playing. Everything about that game is just so memorable, from the music, to the setting, to the villain. Spy Fox 2 still manages to have quality versions of all of those things, however, I don't find the game nearly as enjoyable, and I'll be upfront about it. I truly believe the reasons why I don't enjoy this game as much is because the environment's just nowhere near as colorful to look at, Spy Fox got a voice change, and the setting just isn't as fun. I'm not sure what the reasoning behind this was, but most of the backgrounds in this game specifically are these very dull, dilute grays, greens, and browns that are just lacking that level of vibrancy that was present on the island of Acidophilus. I mean, even just looking at the Mobile Command Center shows how night and day it is. I'm not sure if the game was intentionally going for a more gloomy look to emphasize the threat looming over them in the form of the giant evil dog bot, or if it was just a preferred style of choice, but I'm personally not a fan of it. It just strikes me as dull, and when humongous games typically pride themselves in their bright, distinctive color choices, this just feels like the antithesis to it all. You'd be surprised how easy it is to have one's own mood reflected by the tone of the game both visually and narratively speaking. But that's besides the point. My biggest qualm with the game in general that I wanted to get out of the way first was the general color palette. Other than that, it's pure Spy Fox gameplay in all its glory. Same point and click exploration, same creative characters, same witty writing, although there are a few lines that don't quite land. Spy Fox, you've got to get this trash bag to Spy Corps headquarters. No, I've got a better idea. I'd better get this trash bag to Spy Corps headquarters. But those are few and far between. The voice change is particularly noticeable, however, seeing as Bob Zank voiced him in the first title, but was then replaced by Mike Madoy, I, I apologize for the mispronunciation, comes Spy Fox 2, which the reason for this, according to a Facebook post made by a humongous alumni, was because Bob ended up moving to Hawaii in between the two games and thus was no longer available to voice the character. I personally prefer Bob as the definitive voice of the character, but Mike doesn't do a bad job himself. It's just different enough for me though to notice however while I'm playing, and that kind of has always taken me out of it. Bob was also the voice of other prominent characters throughout the previous Humongous games, with one of his most noteworthy being Outback Owl in Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo. Getting into the plot of this game, since I suppose now is the best time to do so, Spy Fox 2 begins with a pretty interesting opening sequence of Spy Fox getting chased down a mountain by these evil smelly goons. That's S-M-E-L-L-Y by the way, an acronym for the Society of meaningless evil, larceny, lying, and yelling. Of course, our evil nemesis. Yeah, that's a recurring gag throughout the game. Spy Fox has been given an important package of which he needs to return to Spy Corps headquarters as soon as possible before Smelly recovers the item from him, leading to an exciting reaction-based sequence with tons of alternate pathways to travel down. <laughs> guys got water
After a successful escape, SpyFox reports to the president of Spy Corps where he is briefed on his next mission. Infiltrate the World's Fair and put a stop to the evil Napoleon LaRoche, leader of Smelly, who must be plotting an evil scheme of some sort. Spy Corps has yet to figure out what this scheme is, but the only clue they have is this set of instructions on how to build a model replica of the life-size dogbot centerpiece at the World's Fair. From here, Spy Fox is whisked away to the fair's parking lot where he meets up with Monkey Penny and Quack to get a game plan together. Once again, like the last title, Monkey Penny is his main point of contact that provides plenty of helpful information to the player, while Quack is responsible for the different gadgets that Spy Fox has at his disposal. The first order of business, get inside the World's Fair via forgery using this nearby photo booth and the Spy ID maker to create a false identity for Spy Fox to sneak past the security guard, infiltrate the dog bot, and meet up with LaRoche face to face to learn of his diabolical plan. Ah, Napoleon LaRoche. I should have known you'd taken up with the likes of Smelly. So Spycore has sent the famous Spy Fox to try and stop my plans for world domination. World domination? Er, uh, of course. Ha! Ah, since you are one of the few people who could possibly understand my genius, I will explain my entire plan to you in nauseating detail. Upon finishing his rant, LaRoche sends Spy Fox rocketing up to the mouth of the dogbot where he is currently held prisoner, although as luck would have it he manages to find a nearby panel that grants him access to a ladder that lets him escape into the World's Fair. From here, the player is free to roam around the fair and do as they please with the goals of discovering and acquiring the off switch, the dogbot deactivation code, and discovering how to access the inner workings of the dogbot's core. As far as the story goes, it kind of takes a back steed after this moment as cutscenes mostly become relevant after certain milestones are achieved within the game, all of which tend to revolve around the Roach reflecting on how he was too short to go on a ride at the fair when he was a kid, which is explained to be his motive of revenge, or how he can't wait to make the world bow down before him. For a villain, LaRoche seems pretty… alright. I mean, obviously he's a major hyperbole of Napoleon Bonaparte, and the sheer absurdity of him being this tiny little thing controlling a giant robot dog, there's a cool oxymoronic dynamic going on there. I don't know that I necessarily like him as much as William the Kid, heck, LaRoche is probably my least favorite of the Spy Fox rogues gallery, but he's not… bad. What's cool though is that the player can actually return to talk to him multiple times throughout the game if they really want to, and he doesn't do anything about it because he's too lazy to come up with a new prison idea to hold Spy Fox in, even though he clearly keeps escaping the dogbot's mouth without fail. LaRoche, why don't you invent good things instead of evil? I did once, but then I found out that someone else had already invented a vegetable peeler, so I gave up. Now please stay captured, I'm a very busy evil person. I always thought this aspect was strange as a kid, like, I'd expect LaRoche to put up more of a fuss about the fact that the hero keeps escaping, but nowadays I just find it more humorous than anything else. But yeah, gameplay wise this isn't too different from the first game, although there is one key change, that being that instead of having multiple different small possible pathways and a medium sized one in the middle, this game is just broken down into two paths through and through, either the Venus Flytrap path or the Destructolux Restructolux path. All of the puzzles that exist within the game are purely dependent on which path is rolled at the start, so this isn't a case like the first title where one playthrough could have the boat combined with the diode and then another could be the boat combined with the key. Nope, the same objectives are required along both paths but the entire game is split into two possibilities with no crossover whatsoever. So even though it's similar to Freddy Fish 4 for instance in the sense that the same items are collected regardless, there is no crossover potential the way there was in that game. Whether or not I consider this a good thing for the franchise? I'm not entirely sure. It's a completely different way to structure the game because as of this point there hasn't been one where there was essentially two set paths with no overlap in one game, but whether or not I like the idea? I don't know. I suppose that's all in the eye of the beholder. Me personally, I do prefer being able to mix and match things, but I see how these longer pathways could have merit. Of the two paths, I really don't have a preference for one over the other. If anything, they're both roughly the same amount of fun, although the the weird Elmo kid that you have to assist during the Destructolux pathway kind of freaks me out a little bit. Hello, little boy. My name is Fox. Spy Fox. And what is your... My name is Elmo. So, I was talking to the caped cod. The caped cod! You're friends with the caped cod? I can't believe I actually know someone who's friends with the caped cod! 
You can also go see Bee Bear again in this game, as she has left the cantina in Acidophilus to become a masseuse of some sort at the World Fair. Why she decided to make this career choice, I personally have no idea, but she's also a figure skater apparently, which is useful in helping Spy Fox solve one of the puzzles in the game. I suppose I should distinguish this slightly. Technically, the way that you gain access to the inside of the dog bot doesn't vary from playthrough to playthrough. The player always needs to acquire the cleverly chosen rose tinted glasses and view the panel from a telescope in order to figure out what kind of meal Spy Fox would need to eat in order to pass the breathalyzer. The type of meal can vary, however, but the way you duplicate the food item is the exact same each time. Although, the cool thing is that the cloning station at the fair features two sheep named Doll and Lee, named after the famous sheep Dolly, which was big in the news around this time for being the very first successfully cloned animal. As far as getting the deactivation code goes, this piece is also acquired the exact same way in the sense that Walter Wireless, who returns from the first game, needs to get into Wii World in order to meet up with Dottie Dash, which I believe is an intentional reference to Morse code. Dottie had discovered the code, but is unable to get a signal out out to Spy Corps to let them know, so Spy Fox needs to help Walter get in contact with her. There is a slight difference in this section of the game, with the flytrap pathway requiring the player to duplicate a key to gain access, while the other has the player rewiring the security system. After that though, the sequence is the same, but there is this cool mini puzzle where the player gets to take control of Walter for 5 minutes as he navigates around the miniature house. Spy Fox's watch this time around contains a mini game for a space shooter game in which you control a space ship and need to blast all of the various projectiles heading straight for you. This is typical to a lot of arcade space shooter games, so it's not really anything special, but at the very least, again, just like Happy Fun Sub, it is there for you to play if you want to. When it comes to the Venus Flytrap versus the Destructo Lux paths, however, like I said, I really don't have a preference for one over the other. This isn't a go fish situation where I like one of the paths way more than the other, but it just so happens that that's the one that's impeded by a massive obstacle in order to access it. No, both paths are pretty enjoyable throughout and neither have any glaring flaws to them. The Venus Flytrap pathway was the first one I got when I played the game as a kid, so I guess that might have given it a slight edge for me, but that that's about it. I think most of the gadgets in this game are pretty hit and miss. I mean, sure there are some cool ones like the ice skates in which you get to see Spy Fox do this ridiculous figure skating routine or the grenade full of termites, but others like the vacuum and key camera aren't as exciting as something like the exploding nickel trap or the suction cups. And let's be real, nothing can ever beat the shoe. I mean, Come on. Given that Spy Fox is all about geography and going to different locations, I think the concept for a World's Fair is cool because it allows multiple different cultures and ideas to all be represented in one place. Personally, I think it would have been cooler if the game went a little deeper into the world portion of that because all of the fair elements are there. Food stands, the grandstand, exhibits and museums, typical fair. I do wish that the location was a few screens bigger because all in all things do feel a little compact, but I still like the general setting overall. I like a lot of the new character designs as well, no matter how big the chef's nostrils might be. The goat at the ice rink and the caped cod are both cool characters that I enjoy hearing the conversations of, and the security guard at the museum entrance is a total buffoon with how easily tricked he is, but that's half the fun. As I briefly mentioned earlier, I still think the writing in this game holds up, but not quite to the level of dry cereal. I don't know, the thing I've noticed with Spy Fox is that I don't outright dislike some assembly required, but dry cereal is such an incredible game to me that it's just harder for me to get into the sequel as a result. Spy Fox 2 is still plenty fine, it's just that the personal attachment for me is not matched because I don't think I've ever played this game too often as a kid. That's the thing with the Pajama Sam series and why I rank it as my favorite humongous IP. I absolutely love the entire trilogy of Pajama Sam games, whereas with Spy Fox I really 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 love dry cereal, but that's about it. Some Assembly Required has its moments with things like Elmo and Wii World, but it doesn't provide the same sense of thrill that there is driving down the streets of Acidophilus or diving deep underwater to invade the enemy's secret base. I will say, I'm glad this game kept the whole invade the villain's secret hideout aspect from the first game because that was a fantastic part of that game. The rooms inside the dogbot actually change based on which pathway you take, which is cool, so while on one path there's this giant Venus flytrap in the room in the background, 
The other just has a bunch of paintings of La Roche. The dog bot is the only area in the whole game that has new pathways opened up, however, so don't expect any changes at the fair other than the Destructolux building being present or non-existent. And speaking of the dog bot, let's get into this game's ending, shall we? After attaching the deactivation switch and entering the dog bot shutdown code, the millionth visitor at the World's Fair arrives at the exact same time and the dog bot gets fully powered up, allowing LaRoche to finally use his weapon of mass destruction to terrorize the nearby city as his plan for global domination can finally begin. Spy Fox during this excursion actually ends up getting knocked off of the platform due to the dogbot's erratic movements and thus it's up to the player to click on the shutdown switch to get him back up. Keeping him hanging from the platform, however, allows the player to see more scenes of LaRoche destroying the city, so I usually just end up keeping him hanging there as long as possible since the game automatically makes him swing himself back up in the end regardless. Thus, Spy Fox shuts down the dogbot and LaRoche is defeated. Except that in a traditional Spy Fox moment, he attempts to get away in the last minute reaction based chase sequence. I should go in after him. Should Spy Fox miss the sewer drain, he is immediately taken to the end of the game where he earns the measly certificate of achievement from Spy Corps' boss, and the game just sorta ends there. Successfully follow LaRoche down the drain, however, and you're treated to yet another super secret final area in which LaRoche plans his escape. This is great, and as per usual, I'm glad that the Spy Fox series established this as a tradition for this title. However, this is my least favorite final area in the series because the puzzle itself is far simpler than the previous game, if you can even believe that. All the player needs to do is move the pipe that LaRoche is planning on escaping through from Fiji to Spy Jail, which takes two clicks, and then to loosen the hatch here, all of which can be done simply by going the whole way forward and then the whole way back. There doesn't appear to be nearly as much thought required from the player in regards to navigating back and forth between the rooms, although at the very least there are more than there were in Kid's Blimp from Dry Serial, but the complexity of the puzzle isn't very extravagant. Thus, with a simple lever pull, Spy Fox ends up sending LaRoche straight to Spy Jail, capturing him once and for all and putting a stop to any potential future schemes for good, bringing some assembly required to a close with the best ending. And yeah, on the whole, while I think Spy Fox 2 is a fine game, it just doesn't live up to the precedent set by the first one in my eyes. I'm sure Spy Fox 2 has its fans, and I'm sure some will say it's their favorite in the series, which is totally fine. It's an okay game, but I just don't see it personally. The soundtrack is good but not great, the writing is good but not great, the villain is good but not great, the animation is standard humongous by this point, it's just an alright game to me. But hey, I'll take an alright game over an outright bad one any day of the week. For doing such a commendable job in catching Napoleon the Rose Spy Fox, you'll get my eternal gratitude. I had excellent help on this case, Chief. Ah, yes! I present to you the Grand Golden Family Approved Fortified Supreme Certificate of Excellence. Thanks, Chief. It was all in the line of duty. I am King Conglomerate, maker of fine mustards. I won't compete with ketchup. I will utterly destroy it. I will send my robots to eliminate all the world's tomatoes. And when the ketchup runs dry and I force my mustard into the marketplace, the whole world will realize what they have been missing. King Conglomerate Condiments and Technologies will rule the condiment world with an iron fist. Following the release of Some Assembly Required in the Spy Fox series came another junior arcade title known as Hold the Mustard. This title in particular actually has a very interesting backstory, believe it or not, because unlike all of the other arcade titles up until this point in the humongous timeline, this was the first not to be released as a standalone title, but rather as an inclusion inside the Super Duper Arcade 2 compilation alongside Lost and Found, Maze Madness, and Dog on a Stick. 
Humongous would later release this game on its own, but it's considered one of, if not the, rarest junior arcade titles as a result. As the name of the compilation would suggest, there was actually a previous compilation consisting of the other four junior arcade games, but seeing as those were all sold separately when they were first released, I had no reason to bring them up until now. Hold the Mustard, unlike Cheese Chase, is not a sequel to some assembly required, but rather its own storyline consisting of King Conglomerate swooping up all the world's ketchup so that he can sell his mustard products in their place and take over the condiment market in order to become a worldwide billionaire. And while this may not be exactly the same economic scenario as William the Kid's plot from the first game, this is a bit too similar that I don't feel bad in saying it's just copying off of Dry Cereal's evil villain scheme and simplifying it down immensely. At least Cheese Chase had something different from the mainline games, but this feels too similar to call it unique. Regardless, the game doesn't have much of a plot at all, seeing as there are only a handful of cutscenes, and while some levels might start and end with Monkey Penny or Quack coming in to make a statement here and there, it doesn't do much to help transition the game from one area to the next. The cool thing is that there are a lot more unique areas compared to the first Spy Fox arcade game, whether it's this underwater Atlantis area or a tropical beach. The beginning of the game mostly takes place over the Mediterranean Sea, a callback to the setting of Spy Fox 1. The downside is that, unlike Cheese Chase, there are hardly any level transition scenes at all outside of Monkey Penny coming on screen to tell the player where they're going next, which is far less exciting and fulfilling compared to the snappy quick transitions of the spy vehicle when chasing after Russian Blue. The gameplay of this title consists of the player controlling Spy Fox's mess, that's multiple environment spy ship, as it flies around the environment passing through these green gates and shooting down all of the enemies that are trying to steal the tomatoes in the area so that King Conglomerate doesn't get a hold of the world's full supply. The ending cutscene shows he ends up getting a massive supply of them anyway, so what's really the point? But he gets defeated nonetheless, so no harm no foul. The mess also has an air and fuel supply which are important because it creates a limited time frame for the vehicle in each level. Similar to the Happy Fun Sub minigame from Dry Cereal, the mess is capable of flying in air, water, and space, which is where the air meter comes into play as it drains far faster than the vehicle's fuel does. Every level ends when all of the enemies are cleared and the gates are passed through, and that's about it. Relatively simple, all things considered. I wasn't into this one as much as Cheese Chase, given how short that description was. The presentation didn't really do it for me, I wasn't invested in the plot, the final cutscene of the game is kinda weird. There just wasn't a whole lot here that really impressed me in any way. Even the title screen is very bare, providing only a new game and load game option without any ability for custom levels whatsoever. There there's still a way to gain access to the level select by naming yourself I Cheat and then pressing Shift G in the game in order to pick a number from 1 to 101, but it's nowhere near as ideal as there is no longer a level select screen in between each stage. I personally found the game to be boring more than anything else. The levels got monotonous super quick, more so than most of the other junior arcade titles I've played, but yeah, I honestly wasn't impressed by this game. It's functional, sure, but it certainly doesn't live up to the fun part of that word. Yeah, I'd pass on this one personally. You're already too late, Mr. Fox. All of your precious tomatoes have been loaded aboard this giant remote-controlled rocket. You'll notice that I've aimed it directly at a black hole. Remote-controlled rocket, you say? Yes, yes. Remote-controlled. Now, as I was saying... <clears throat> you mean to say that your giant rocket is controlled by this remote control. Yes, it's a remote controlled rocket controlled by that remote control. <laughs> is the concept too hard for you to understand? Now please, would you let me finish? I'll begin with putting mustard. Oh no. Somewhere in the Scottish Highlands. Oh, you're right, awful there, laddie. Maybe so, but the smoke's on you, laddie. 
You mean the joke's on me, don't ya? Please stop that. <laughs> like I said, the smoke's on you. I've infiltrated the bad guy's base. Now I need to find my informant. He has vital information that I must get back to Spy Corps. So, up until about a year ago, I was always under the impression that the third and final Spy Fox title was also the last wholly original Humongous Entertainment Junior Adventure game to release before Infogrames laid off all of its employees and set off the catalyst that eventually destroyed the company from within. Turns out that the fifth Freddy Fish game is actually the last one to release, but this here was sold in stores just a few months prior to the company's demise anyways, so suffice to say we're approaching the end of Humongous's run. Spy Fox in Operation Ozone, or as I'll mostly call it in the video, Spy Fox 3, because I like consistency and something that's always bothered me is how the first game in the series is titled Spy Fox in Dry Serial, and the second game is Spy Fox 2, colon, some assembly required. And excluding the arcade titles, which I don't really count anyways, it's just strange that 3 is going back to the first one. There's not really any consistency. I know this is just semantics, but the fact of the matter is that I don't like the inconsistency. I do, however, like this game more than the second one, but also not as much at the same time. Spy Fox 3 is a weird one to talk about, so I'm just gonna dive into the plot to set things up. Operation Ozone begins with a similar sequence to Spy Fox 2 in the sense that Spy Fox meets up with a fellow Spy Corps operative named Roger Bohr, a play on the James Bond actor Roger Moore. It is here that he receives a special message that he needs to deliver to Spy Corps ASAP as well as an origami skateboard he can use as a getaway item. Funny story though, if you go out of your way to purposely misassemble the item, it actually can turn into one of the three other Junior Adventure characters' heads as an origami form, which is a neat little easter egg that amused me so much as a kid. Anyways, from there, Spy Fox escapes in this elaborate chase sequence that sadly does not have the same level of interactivity that the Alps chase from the intro to Spy Fox 2 had, but at the very least it was a pretty cool cutscene, so no harm no foul. I think the moment where the banana morphs into the aerosol can is actually the most iconic moment of the entire game, if you ask me. Anyway, Spy Fox delivers the message to the president of Spy Corps and gets sent to rendezvous with Quack and Monkey Penny, as per usual, in the hot air balloon mobile command center located floating above the bowling alley. Floating high above the bowling alley is Mobcom Spy Corps Mobile Command Center. You've really taken the Mobile Command Center to new heights, Monkey Penny. Glad you could drop up, Spy Fox. Once again, the Spy Fox series is showing its creativity with its bases of operation, and what's even cooler is that in order to access it in the first place, Spy Fox needs to enter the correct code on the jukebox. Funnily enough, I distinctly remember playing Spy Fox 3 on my dad's laptop once as a kid. I can't remember what laptops were like back then and whether some had speakers or not. Maybe there were laptops that did not have built-in speakers, or maybe my dad was just playing a trick on me so he didn't have to hear the game in the background while he tried to watch the TV. I have no idea but I distinctly remember that I could never access Spy Corps' mobile command center in this game because I couldn't hear the audio cue to read what it was. I didn't know how speakers worked, laptops were brand new technology to me as like a 7 year old kid, and there's no visual indicator here either, so I was stuck guessing every possible combination for like 10 minutes before I eventually gave up and accepted that I was in a dead game. The same thing happened when I tried to dial the phone at the beginning of Dry Serial, so let it be known that you're in for a bad time if you try to play a Spy Fox game without Without any audio. Spy Fox's first order of business after meeting up in the mobile command center is to free the genius scientist Plato Pushpin, a former employee who was recently taken hostage after getting caught trying to stop the nefarious poodles galore with her latest evil scheme. Poodles is, of course, the primary villain of this game, named after a recognizable James Bond character with her primary characteristics being deeply embedded in cosmetics. Hair care, lipstick, nail polish, powder, you name it, she probably sells it. Her grandmaster plan consists of her breaching through the ozone layer with her astronomic aerosol can to create a hole so gargantuan it causes everybody to burn up because the planet would get 
that hot. She is doing this with the intent of forcing everybody around the world to buy her SPF 2001 sunscreen, as it is the only sunscreen powerful enough to protect them from the harsh ultraviolet radiation of the hot sun that's beating down on the entire planet's surface. And this is where I think the dry cereal and some assembly required comparisons are going to come into play, because this game essentially feels like it took some ideas from dry cereal, some ideas from assembly, and then added a couple original things too. But unfortunately as a result, I have to call this game the weakest in the series in terms of its story. It's strange, I really remember enjoying this game as a kid, but going back to it now, my enjoyment of the plot has diminished quite a bit because I now notice a lot of rehashed ideas amongst the sea of isolated game environments that just leave the entire product feeling disjointed. This was one of, if not the last humongous entertainment games I ever owned as a kid, so I had played the other games in the series before this one and still enjoyed it quite a lot, which is why this is such a surprise to me. Here's what I mean. As already mentioned, the game opens in the exact same way that Spy Fox 2 did. Next, the game takes a cue from Spy Fox 1 by having an intro sequence where Spy Fox arrives at the new location, finds a way into Spy Corps Mobile Command Center using an audio cue, is tasked with rescuing some kind of important figure who is involved in opposing the villain's evil scheme, and rescues them before opening up the rest of the game. Not to mention that the villain's entire motivation is to take over the world with their product and corporation. William the Kid wanted to do it with goat milk, and Poodles Galore wants to do it with cosmetics. Monkey Penny debriefs Spy Fox on the whereabouts of Plato Pushpin, which just so happens to be inside the bowling alley located directly beneath them. Thus, after gathering this information and disguising himself as himself, because Poodles has no idea who he is at this point, he pretends to be their fourth bowling member, Alice, and agrees to join them in their little game after acquiring the proper uniform. Yes, unlike the last two games where the villains were familiar with Spy Fox meddling affairs, this time the villain actually has never encountered him before, which provides for an interesting dynamic that progresses throughout the game, so I can give it that at least. I understand Poodles' motivation for loathing Spy Fox so much, I mean he straight up lied to her, and stole her prized victim. Thanks to the Spy Gadget bowling ball capture device that Quack was able to load into the vending machine, which Spy Fox then uses to rescue Pushpin from an untimely demise and gets away while avoiding Poodles' terrifying bowling ball of death. Seriously, you see that thing? It's got saw blades and cutters coming out of it, like, what the heck? You go first! I want to savor this moment! Well, that was fun. Time to split! Pushpin! He is gone! Ace! Camp! He must have Pushpin! Don't let him get away! <laughs> Thus, they return to the safety of the mobile command center where Plato Pushpin explains that they can stop the aerosol can if, and only if, Spy Fox can get him the necessary materials to create the congeal pill, a pill containing a mix of ingredients that can clog up the aerosol can for good and stop poodles from damaging the holes in the ozone layer any further. And I think it's pretty obvious that this game is a product of its time, more so than the other titles, just based on this ozone layer premise by itself. Remember, this game came out in 2001, so the ozone layer was a hot topic around that period in time. Pushpin needs Spy Fox to acquire four different items that can be used in the congeal pill. The serial number written directly on the outside of the giant aerosol can, a piece of chicle located in the jungle, a food item that varies from playthrough to playthrough, and an item from the lake that also varies as well. As such, this means that this game only has four potential combinations of pathways that the player can take, meaning that it's a little more diverse than Spy Fox 2, but ultimately can still be beaten in the same number of playthroughs. Operation Ozone takes a more traditional approach to the gameplay structure of providing the player with four objectives that they can tackle in any order they wish, rather than encouraging them along a more linear path in the vein to something like Dry Cereal, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, akin to the likes of some assembly required, the story is unfortunately pushed into the backseat with cutscenes only really displaying whenever Spy Fox completes one of his objectives rather than pacing itself properly like in Spy Fox 1. Again, this isn't a huge deal, but as someone who really enjoys the narrative of the first game, it kinda pains me to say that the sequels just don't live up to that level of storytelling and writing in general. Unfortunately, this game feels like an even bigger step down from Spy Fox 2 when it comes to the writing because there aren't that many clever moments when the characters use play on words and Spy Fox repeats his classic, I'm in there like swimwear, too many times to where it just wears out its welcome. 
The amulet worked. I'm in there like swimwear. That opened the door. I'm in there like swimwear. Stick em. Copy that, Spy Fox. We're in there like swimwear. Hey, that's my... Oh, never mind. It becomes less of a one-time joke and more of an annoying recurring gag. At the very least, the game does lean more into the James Bond references than previous titles, what with the aforementioned Roger Boar and Poodle's galore characters, as well as the fact that the aerosol can is likely a different take on the GoldenEye satellite from the film of the same name. I like those references and think that that's pretty cool, but those only go so far. So with that, let's get into the puzzles of this game now, shall we? First up is the aerosol particle diameter number on the aerosol can, as that was always the first objective I would go for whenever I played this game as a kid. Thanks to Plato Pushpin's employee ID having not been deactivated yet, Spy Fox is able to sneak into Poodles' factory fortress and disguise himself using the wig maker, of which Roger Boar appears once again to inform him of the current trendy hairdo. And then using the sticky stun bun, he's able to trap all of the guards to the ceiling, acquiring the keys to one of Poodles' lipstick rockets, and flies on up into space to write down a copy of that aerosol can's number. This one's pretty straightforward, honestly, and it never changes from playthrough to playthrough, but but the fact that the player can sneak into the evil villain's lair ahead of time is always a cool treat and one of my favorite aspects of the Spy Fox series, so I'm glad that that trope makes a return here. As far as the rest of the game goes, it's ultimately split up into three additional regions on top of the current outskirts that Spy Fox finds himself in. Quack must have fixed the trans Google gear. Now I'll be able to travel across the globe spy style. You know, it's a good thing that car didn't sustain any damage there, but the fact that Quack just dropped this thing out of the sky without a worry that some innocent civilian could have been directly underneath of it as it impacted the ground is kind of messed up. Like, what if some kid was just wandering around and got flattened like a pancake? Then what, Quack? The blood is on your hands. But getting back to the whole disjointed idea. The spy car is introduced as a means of allowing Spy Fox to travel to three different locations. The jungle, the desert, and the lake, based in South America, Africa, and Asia, respectively. It is at each of these areas where each of the three remaining items can be obtained, starting with the Chickle, located in the jungle inside of the Temple of Chickle P. Chu. This is the other item Pushpin tasks Spy Fox with that never changes no matter what playthrough is rolled when the player boots up the game. It's a relative fun puzzle seeing as there are two locks outside the temple preventing Spy Fox from gaining access, so he needs to solve them in order to get inside. Then of course, once he's actually made it within the temple, there are other booby traps that he needs to overcome in order to head deeper and deeper inside the ziggurat. This is where the spy gadgets of the game come into play, and boy are there a lot of them. Ten in total, to be exact, more than either of the previous two Spy Fox titles with most but not all of them being used in both playthroughs. It's actually a little overwhelming, honestly, because unlike Spy Fox 1 or 2 where you have four slots available and can usually carry just enough tools that you won't have to backtrack to Spy Core to acquire them, Spy Fox 3 most certainly forces the player to do so because each area aside from the desert usually requires two to three gadgets in order to obtain the necessary item. For instance, the Chickle needs the Granny, Toaster, and Rust in a Can in order for Fox to obtain it, while Poodles' factory requires the Glass and Sticky Stun Bun. I really do enjoy the gadgets here though, more so than the second game at the very least. As they say, a spy without his gadget is like a shopping cart without a broken wheel. The Chickle is also fun because it includes a reference to Indiana Jones of all things, proving that the game wasn't afraid to step outside its usual genre of inspiration to add some spice into the mix. But as for the other two objectives, let's get the food item out of the way first. Depending on the playthrough in question, Pushpin will either task Spy Fox with acquiring a prickly pear pizza or a secret donut XY, both of which can be obtained at the food shack across the road from the bowling alley, although in both scenarios the waitress doesn't have the resources at her disposal to make them because either A, prickly pears are out of stock, or B, the employee who knows the formula for the donut quit and moved to the desert after undergoing a massive lifestyle change. Both of these food items require the player to travel to the desert actually, with both also being found in the exact same location. The only difference is that in the case of the prickly pear, this pig lady refuses to let anybody through except for beekeepers, meaning that Spy Fox actually needs to acquire a beekeeper's hat in order to get through. Where can he acquire such a hat? Wow, this is quite a bee farm. It's called an apiary, honey. My name's Fox. Spy Fox. 
Have we met before? I think I met you at the World's Fair. Or it could have been on the Greek Isle of Acidophilus. My name's B. B Bear. Is there anything I can get you, honey? Say, for instance, honey? That's right. Once again, B returns as a background character that can actually talk to Fox along the way and help him out as needed. In fact, she even references how familiar he looks and calls back to her former occupations in the past two games as a nice nostalgic callback to the previous entries in the series. Which is cool, I'm glad the self-awareness is present here. B lends her hat to Spy Fox free of charge and thus he's able to sneak past without issue. Of course, should the player be placed on the donut path instead of the pizza path so that he can speak to the former donut shop worker and get the secret recipe. A new problem arises with the prickly pears, however, when he tries to leave the patch of prickly pears with one in hand. Hi! Hey, you there! With the prickly pear! Prickly pear? What prickly pear? The x-ray machine shows that you have a prickly pear. Now all prickly pears stay in the prickly pear ranch. Those are the rules. Luckily, there's a clever workaround present, so no dead game here. Taking the pear back to the diner nets Spy Fox the prickly pear pizza. However, giving the waitress the donut recipe leads to a new situation where she is missing a different ingredient, tapioca. Thankfully though, the solution to this puzzle just involves visiting this pelican in the jungle and trading him a donut for some. And then the secret donut XY is obtained without issue. The second of the variable items lies in the lake location, where Spy Fox can either acquire a pearl by taking a Girl Scout's megaphone to shout at this old man across the river that can't hear him very easily, and then using a duck helmet which somehow makes him invisible to ducks just by putting it on. I don't know how this works and whether or not it's more ludicrous than the night vision shoe, but either way, Getting past the duck isn't so bad, and then using the pearl detector, Spy Fox is able to search through all of these muscles and obtain one upon finding it. This, along with the prickly pear pizza, were the items I rolled on my first playthrough and are both my preferred pathways when playing the game. Although, I can't deny that the other lake item is probably the easier item to acquire because you aren't required to deliver Girl Scout cookies to the bowling alley attendant, B, and this beaver girl in the jungle. That's a great megaphone! Thanks! I use it to shout at potential customers because I can be hard to hear! What kind of potential customers? Potential cookie buyers! I only have to sell three more boxes of cookies to get an official Cookie Scout stunt bike! Completely tricked out with foot pegs, banana style saddle, alligator grips, and this thing in the handlebars that tells time! Wow, that sounds pretty neat! Instead, it's as easy as returning the bowling shoes from the jungle and swapping them for these flippers, and then swimming out to the lake and diving underneath to find the correct clay that's submerged underwater. Of course, in order to know which square is the correct one, Spy Fox can traverse up to the top level to view this map guarded by the same duck who blocks the muscles. Although for whatever reason, Humongous decided to make the duck helmet unavailable on this pathway and instead force the player to have to time when Spy Fox sneaks past the guard in order to unlock the gate down below. Upon acquiring the fourth and final item, and taking them back to Pushpin, he can construct and finish the congeal pill in full so that Spy Fox can finally put an end to that aerosol can of mayhem and destruction. Unfortunately, however, you can't just give all four items to Pushpin at once. Instead, you have to painstakingly hand each item to him one at a time over and over again. And this is where I want to acknowledge a significant change to Spy Fox's inventory in Operation Ozone. Unlike Spy Fox 1 and 2, which had limited the total amount of items items Spy Fox could be carrying at one time, Operation Ozone decided to introduce this pocket that contains all of the other potential non-gadget and non-speech bubble items, instead having them pop up and slide to the right to display every item in his tux. However, this makes using items very monotonous because you're forced to sit through this little scrolling animation every single time you want to pull an item. It's no longer as snappy as clicking on bubbles at the bottom of the Freddy Fish games or inside Putt-Putt's dashboard. It's not a huge detriment or anything, but sitting through this sequence of handing Pushpin all of the items feels like it could pass by so much faster than it actually does. Oh, and yeah, if you get the pizza route, Pushpin doesn't actually need it to construct the pill. He's just hungry and needed Spy Fox to be his errand boy. Well, I risked bee stings and scalding hot cheese, but I've got the prickly pear pizza. Pushpin! That was a vital ingredient for the congeal pill. 
Yes! Without the pizza's nourishing qualities, I would have collapsed with hunger! I'll admit, it did get a surprise reaction out of me the first time I played this game, so at the very least it was effective, even if I did feel burned afterwards because I remember getting stuck on that puzzle for a bit, only for that to be the end result. But with that, the congeal pill is finally finished, and Spy Fox heads back up to the orbiting aerosol can to drop the pill into the hair care mixture, then put an end to Poodles' plan once and for all. What? No, I don't think so. You weren't very good at bowling either, darling. Just who are you anyway? Fox. Spy Fox. And in the name of Spy Corps... I hereby place you under spy arrest. Not today, Foxy! I must warn you that I'm an expert in cock-a-doodle foo. Well, that could have gone better. Good thing Quack gave him just the tool he needed to escape, and with that he's able to break out of the steel net and trapping him, grab the pill out of the trash can, throw it into the concoction below, and finally put an end to Poodles' plan for real this time. And it wouldn't be a Spy Fox game without multiple endings, however, unlike the first two where accessing the ultimate final area is based on whether or not the player reacts in time to clicking on the obstacle that would allow them to catch the villain, this time it's entirely based on whether or not the player clicks on the door to leave or lets the cutscene play out. And let me just say this game is extremely lenient with this time window, much more so than what the window felt like in Some Assembly Required did, and in that game, getting Spy Fox up off the ledge wasn't even the trigger for accessing the final area anyways. Although now I'm recognizing yet another parallel between those games with Spy Fox hanging from a ledge during the big climax and destruction of the villain's weapon contraption. Should the player fail to escape in time, the game will automatically force Spy Fox to run out, get in a rocket, and head back to Earth, where he earns the pretty big award of reasonable merit for only destroying the aerosol can and not capturing Poodles galore. Should the player make an escape in a timely manner, however, Spy Fox does give chase after Poodles and flies straight for the moon, where her secret base of operations is located and where she plans to lay low for a while while she plots her next evil scheme. And this, my friends, is where the best final area of any Spy Fox game is introduced, in my opinion. Poodles' moon base, which may or may not be an intentional reference to James Bond's Moonraker, is packed with the most amount of things to do in comparison to Kid and LaRoche's getaway areas. More click points, more puzzles, and far more screens that provide for an exciting final climax as Spy Fox ultimately tries to sneak past Poodles' giant powder puff machine that keeps brutally attacking him every time he tries to walk over to the security cameras. Okay, powder puff, give me all you've got! Ah! Heh, it was just a little powder. The Dionic Stopulator disguised as a perfume bottle did the trick. Poodles' powder puff is out of commission. I genuinely love this final area. It has a multi-staged puzzle that really has the player thinking, and unlike LaRoche's escape room, which was dark and drab and filled with sewer water, this area here is full of bright pink, colorful contraptions, and far more interesting background areas. I mean, this room up above the powder puff machine has such an eye-catching perspective, not to mention the security room, which contains different camera angles of various employees working all over the facility. I loved William the Kid's area, don't get me wrong, but it suffered a bit from simplicity in its final puzzles. This here feels like the perfect balance in terms of complexity and length. The ultimate goal here is to get to the security room so that Spy Fox can find a camera that displays the nail pattern on Poodles Galore's hand so that he can disable the deflector shield from inside using the control panel that he sees her use upon his first arrival. In doing so, Spy Fox manages to unlock the shield and expose the facility, allowing Monkey Penny and the rest of Spy Corps outside to intercept and arrest all of those workers working here on the moon base. And that draws the final Spy Fox game in its series to a close. I can't say that it's necessarily bad. It kind of falls into the same trap as Pajama Sam 3, where it's a totally functional quality game on its own, but when comparing it to the other titles that fall within the same franchise, its imperfections begin to shine through. Still, I think there are a lot of attributes that Spy Fox 3 does better than Spy Fox 2, but Spy Fox 2 still did it first. I know, my opinion on this one's a little confusing, and I'm sorry if I've been 
contradictive at all, but I really just can't decide one way or the other, I'm sorry. Even still, there are plenty of exciting moments present in here no matter how disjointed the game may come across at times. I think Poodles Galore is a far more interesting villain than La Roche ever was if I'm being honest, although her scheme is a little copy-pasted, and her base of operations was far more interesting than the Dogbot ever was in either of that game's playthroughs. I'd still recommend Spy Fox 3 for fans of the series, but it's never been my go-to choice. I'm always going to encourage playing Dry Cereal above all else because it is the bona fide Spy Fox experience. Besides, this game doesn't ask you to see its tattoo, so that by default makes it an inferior game. Thanks, Monkey Penny, it really wasn't necessary. I was using the Spy Play Possum maneuver. Sure, Spy Fox. Would you believe the Limp Biscuit maneuver? Mm-hmm. How about the Dead Fish maneuver? Mm-hmm. Here, have some hard candy. Got milk? Not anymore. By this point, it should be obvious that Spy Fox 1 also received a Wii port at the same time that Freddy Fish and Pajama Sam did, so I'm going to give brief mention to it as well. Unlike the other two ports, Spy Fox Dry Cereal didn't have its title completely butchered for this 2008 re-release, they just removed the word in from the title for some unknown reason. Same issues as before though, cheap menu screen, terrible emulation, no improvements whatsoever, it's just an inferior version to the original. I don't know what else there is to say. Like I've said before, I enjoy the idea of playing a point-and-click game on the Wii, but this port was so butchered that the game is borderline unplayable with how sloppy the animation is after having played the original. I don't have anything good to say about it that I wouldn't have already said about the superior original version or the Steam port for that matter. The only reason to ever get this trilogy of games is purely for the collection aspect, but actually playing them? Nah, don't waste the time of day. Hey, you saved me! Thank you, Mr. Um... Uh, Fox. Spy Fox. Routine rescue, really? Now I need to get you to our mobile command center for a debriefing. Good! I need to change my pants. <laughs> You've got to stop him, Mr. Fox! All right, just calm down, Mr. Utterly. Why don't you start from the beginning and tell us what happened? Spy Fox, are you okay? Shaken, but not stirred, Monkey Penny. And of course, we can't forget to talk about the Spy Fox demos and cut content as well. As is typical junior adventure game fare at this point, all three Spy Fox games have a variety of cut animations, items, songs, and many other features on top of that. What I find to be most interesting, however, is that one of the most common forms of cut content from all three of the mainline games is that there are loads of cut lines and conversations, far more than the other junior adventure series by a landslide. Of course, as with before, all of these items can be found documented on the cutting room floor, which is the primary source of my information for this section of the video. Luckily, with Spy Fox, there weren't any controversial scenes involving the characters doing something gruesome, like feeding their friend to an eel, or that one moment in Pajama Sam 2, but there was one cut scene from Spy Fox 2 that involved an electric chair. Okay, maybe this could be controversial for some, and I guess I see why it was cut, given that there might be too strong of a moment for kids to witness here, especially with its connotations to capital punishment, which I'm sure many parents didn't want their kids to be subjected to at the time. I mean, this scene is literally referred to as burn baby burn within the game's files. At least Humongous had a sense of humor. Spy Fox 3 also had one cut moment of a very, very strange animation that's just off-putting more than anything else. This is some freaky chef. Can I help you? Eh, just looking, but thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah, 
Even in 2001, Humongous was still prone to putting strange scenes into some of their games. But as far as cut content goes for the Spy Fox series, that's mostly it. There is of course a debug mode for the various different watch mini games, which allow the player to do things like play in turbo mode, and the same can be said for Hold the Mustard, which is how you're able to perform the level select in that game, seeing as the standard Junior Arcade menu format is no longer present in that title. Otherwise, I'm just about ready to get into the demos, and what better way to start than by getting back to Dry Cereal once again. One thing that's actually interesting about Dry Cereal's demo is that there are actually two different versions of it available, the original restricted demo and the E3 demo that I presume to have been shown off at the convention back in 1997. The E3 version of the demo isn't as special as it sounds, however, because it is literally just the entire first sequence that I had described in the video earlier, all over again with zero changes made to it. Spy Fox falls from a plane, goes to the command center, gets the gadget, heads back up and down to the dock, enters the factory, and rescues utterly. The actual demo, despite being shorter, is more interesting because it cuts out a lot of that. Specifically, the falling sequence with the spy pens and the portion where he rendezvous with Monkey Penny inside the command center. It's good to see you, Agent Fox. Monkey Penny. Yesterday, our spy operatives discovered the factories and offices of Amalgamated Moo Juice Incorporated abandoned and drained of milk. Here's the only clue we have. Feta cheese. Spy operatives took that picture in the office of Mr. Howard Hugh Heffer Utterly III. President and CEO of Amalgamated Moo Juice Incorporated. We presume he has valuable information on the dairy crisis. Instead, as soon as he lands, he just has the toothbrush gadget from the get-go and can immediately head down to the dock where he rescues utterly. Yeah, Dry Cereal is kind of the first humongous demo to really just do the whole first five minutes thing now that I think about it. I mean, aside from Putt-Putt Joins the Parade, obviously. But all other demos that existed for games prior to this one, those being Putt-Putt Goes to the Moon, Saves the Zoo, Freddy Fish 1 and 2, Pajama Sam 1, and technically Putt-Putt Travels Through Time, although I wouldn't know if I should count that because it was released just a few months before Dry Cereal. Either way, it still fits. They all include portions of the game that took place after the initial intro sequence. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, as a result, this makes the dry serial demo rather unremarkable to talk about. Other than cutting some content, it's the exact same thing we've already seen. Some assembly required, on the other hand, thankfully, isn't just the opening sequence. No, instead this one is all about getting that rose from Madame Ladybug via figure skating, although Spy Fox has to go meet up with Bee Bear first in order to acquire the written moves that need to be inserted for the skates to work. What's funny is that Bee's tent was placed where the fire hydrant gate is located at the World's Fair, and given that I played the demo for this title before experiencing the full game, I genuinely thought that hydrant was a tent for the longest time. I mean, it's far enough away in the distance that it could be mistaken for one, right? Well, anyways, it's a pretty straightforward demo, but at the very least some rooms got rearranged, which I always find interesting, and it's not just the opening sequence all over again. I don't think this demo necessarily does a good job at capturing what the full game experience is like, seeing as it's kind of like Pajama Sam 2 in the sense that it's just one random puzzle simplified into three screens, unlike the full game where it requires a few more steps to complete, but hey, it's fine enough. Of the three Spy Fox demos, I'd say it's the most interesting one to talk about, for sure. Which, yes, means that Operation Ozone's demo isn't all that interesting, and it's really not, because once again, it's most of the intro sequence that takes place after the initial getaway at the beginning of the game. Spy Fox arrives at the bowling alley, gets his gadget and bowling shirt, joins Poodles in a round of bowling in order to rescue Plato Pushpin from his utter demise. Yeah, that's all I got. I don't know what more I'm really supposed to say about this demo because it's literally the exact same sequence I had already talked about earlier in the video. So, yeah. That's all I've got for the Spy Fox demos, unfortunately. I wish there were some more interesting things to talk about the way there was with... Well, basically all the demos I named for the games that were released before Dry Serial. I still wanted to cover the Spy Fox demos in this video because I had already done the same for the other three Junior Adventure IPs, and I wanted to be consistent. Even still, like I said, there are a lot of interesting bits of cut content on record for all three of the mainline games, so that's definitely worth checking out at the very least, but aside from that, I've got nothing more to add to this section, so moving on. <laughs> Will Spy Fox save Mr. Utterly? 
which falls faster, 400 pounds of feathers or 400 pounds of beef? <coughs> Will Mr. Utterly fall through the ice? Can Piranha utterly strip a cow to the bone in seconds flat? Why am I shouting? Find out all the answers and more. Spy Fox in Dry Cereal. And with that, the Spy Fox series coverage has come to an end. With all of its games being released within a five year time span, this franchise had a very short run and that's honestly a shame because I feel like there was still some potential present here in the series. Sure by the time things got to Operation Ozone there started to be some repeat schemes and tropes that lost a bit in the originality department, but considering how many different James Bond movies there are, I find it impossible to believe a fourth Spy Fox game couldn't have done something different. Alas, thanks to Infogrames being the corporate scum that they are, fired 40% of the humongous staff just a few months after this game's release, thus sending the series to an early grave and decades later there has still not been a game since. It's a shame too, this was humongous entertainment's attempts at branching out to a slightly older audience and it just makes you wonder how much farther the company could have progressed had they been given more opportunity and time to continue growing as a company. On the whole, Spy Fox will always be my second favorite humongous franchise. Dry Serial is one hell of a game that I continue to play over and over again. It's just that enjoyable. The rest of the series is fine too, but man, that one game is just so good. But that just about concludes my Spy Fox retrospective, so next in line is going to be a slightly different kind of video. Rather than tackle a bunch of the smaller side computer games that Humongous Entertainment put out over the years in their own individual respective videos, I'm going to be covering them all in one giant compilation. Fatty Bear, Let's Explore, Big Thinkers, Blue's Clues, and Moonbase Commander. Hope you're looking forward to those, and until next time, Shadow Streak, signing off.